Jones, a managing director at Maxim Integrated, where he leads a team responsible for embedded security products. With over 25 years at Maxim, Scott leads product management, definition, and end customer business development. And prior to Maxim, he held embedded hardware and software engineering positions at other technology companies. Roughly 20 years ago, he joined a Maxim startup team with a focus on security ICs for cost sensitive applications. And now many years later, and after hard lessons learned from smart people who like to break security, Maxim offers secure authenticator products that are used in all end markets. With regards to this session today, uh, disposable medical sensors and tools in the supply chain are often non-genuine or misused, thus introducing the potential to put patient safety at risk. A simple and highly effective solution to this problem is the use of a secure authenticator IC in the disposable. This tiny IC provides just the right amount of hardware-based cryptography, along with the non-volatile memory to securely store collaboration data, tool or sensor use information, and most importantly, enable the host medical equipment to verify the disposable is in fact genuine. In this session, Scott will review the medical end application requirements that drive the need for a secure authenticator and explore a typical use case based on a device that uses the industry standard SHA-3 cryptographic algorithm. So without further ado, I will hand over to Scott. All right, thanks a lot, Joe, and, and welcome everyone. Again, my name is Scott Jones, but Maxim, as Joe pointed out, and I'm part of a unit where we develop these embedded security products. Um, these are devices uh, with, with cryptography, of course, um, and, and these are intended to be used in uh, deeply embedded applications. And, and so today I'm gonna talk about a class of these products uh, like just described called secure authenticators. Um, so, you know, the topic for today's session, why does a medical tool or a sensor or other peripheral, could be, you know, cartridges, uh, containers that might hold a pharmaceutical. Let's group all of these in with all of these in what we'll call disposables. You know, why would these need security? Okay. So, yeah, let's just jump straight, straight to, uh, to that topic. And, and so the answer is, uh, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, these products, um, uh, you know, that, that we're going to be speaking to today are typically misused or often misused, I suppose I should say. We see a statistic here from the World Health Organization, like one in 10 of these uh, medical um, devices in developing uh, countries are either substandard or falsified. Again, you know, from other data we've seen, roughly 8% of the product in supply chain can be counterfeit. And, and what's not reported is, you know, a lot of these products can be misused. For example, a, a device um, that has been used uh, properly, disposed of, then uh, kind of harvested out of uh, medical waste, cleaned up a little bit, and put back into the supply chain. So, again, safe, uh, patient safety uh, is, is a primary uh, reason why we're going to be uh, thinking about security for these devices. Um, so, let's let's kind of go through these a little bit more and, and think about products that are going to be most vulnerable to uh, these counterfeits and misuse. And then, for example, I'm just showing uh, here is a, a surgical tool used for ablation, for example, uh, and fusion pump. Inside here, we will have uh, cartridges that will hold pharmaceuticals, uh, sensors, um, uh, and, and a catheter. So these are all items typically they are going to come into contact with a human. So And, and they're also going to be uh, products that are, are high targets, if you will, for, for the aftermarket. Could be high volume, could be high value. So all of these are, again, targets and, and uh, devices where we want to consider adding some security to protect them. All right, so, you know, let's, let's also think about um, medical peripherals and, and how they're designed to be used. And, and as I point out here, they're, they're really um, designed to be used under specific use conditions. I'll give some examples um, for, you know, limited duration. So here, a tool, a sensor designed to be used for a specific period of time, you know, and after which performance, you know, potentially degrades or could be designed for a limited number of, of uh, reuses. So perhaps, you know, 10 times, 100 times, whatever the number is, again, once that maximum is reached, uh, performance uh, can degrade. Or we even have a one-time use products where after it's been used, you know, for either biological safety reasons or again, performance, uh, it needs to be discarded. So, you know, with that, let's, let's think about how we would, uh, I mean, some of the questions we would ask, you know, um, in terms of uh, managing and enforcing use with hardware-based security if you're a customer. So do you have an existing problem that could be solved with security? Or do you have a tool or a sensor, you know, that could be a target for counterfeiting or improper use? You know, for safety quality reasons, is it, you know, highly important, you know, that these tools, these peripherals be genuine? 
Um, threats do exist. Is, is the reality is our experience, and, and you know, one way to implement security in one of these tools or sensors could be with a, you know, a non-secure microcontroller with some software that implements some level of security to then, you know, protect that tool, authorize its use, and so on. But um, the reality is that solution, while you know, is, is a way to do it, is is also very easy to compromise. I mean, you just go out onto to the web and do a pretty simple search. You can find lots of companies, and we know some of these companies in particular. We've worked with them who can easily, you know, break that sort of a solution, you know, of just a low-cost, you know, non-secure micro. And so, again, our proposition is to really do this in, in a way, an effective way, and we think a cost-effective way, as well as to use um, this device that we're going to talk about a little bit more, a secure authenticator, I see. All right, and so with that, I'd like to talk about, you know, what is a secure authenticator? And first, I'll, I'll speak to end application use of these devices. So I've touched on some of these already, IP protection. Let's think uh, here about, you know, uh, ensuring that a, a counterfeit product or a copy product uh, this does not uh, get get used, you know, in the application. Authenticating the device itself. So again, a tool authenticating, uh, being authenticated to, to an instrument before using. Feature settings, so we could have different levels of functionality um, that we would want a, a particular tool or a peripheral uh, to provide, and, and we want to actually set those features in some device in the tool in a secure way. And so again, an authenticator is really good at that. Use management, we spoke to this. Tool can be used for some period of time or number of uses. Data firmware integrity, if we have that in the tool. Message uh, authentication or integrity, for example, if a tool or a sensor probably more accurately makes a measurement and delivers that measurement over to an instrument. A secure authenticator is a fantastic product to provide wrap, let's just say wrap some security around that measurement and to ensure that you know it's delivered to the tool without you know any uh, of that message uh, being modified either intentionally or non-intentionally, or it can be detected if that happens. When we think about a secure authenticator. These are some of the typical device features, very easy to use. It's probably the most important. Uh, these products um, are fixed function in nature. There's no firmware that gets developed and flashed into the, these devices you know, by the customer. They got a fixed function command set, nice cryptographic toolbox, again, for this sort of an application. We think about you know, cryptography, there's two classes of algorithms at it, you know, the high level, symmetric, also known as secret key, or asymmetric, known as public key. And we're going to support both of those algorithm types um, with these products. Bidirectional authentication, this means if we got an instrument, for example, and a tool uh, in one direction, the tool is authenticated to the instrument, and in the other direction, uh, the tool will require that the instrument authenticate itself, if you will, before modifying, for example, some uh, data value that the authenticator uh, holds and, and makes available. Secure use counting, we talked about this, use management, uh, secure system data storage could be operating parameters, you know, that get delivered over to an instrument. We want to make sure that that data is, uh, you know, secured, cannot be modified. And secure general purpose I.O. could be turning on, turning off something. Um, and, and or sensing, you know, some state. So these these are, you know, again, attributes of a secure authenticator. So let's talk a little bit about how now it would be used in an application. And here, I'm, you know, again, high level showing uh, on the on this, uh, in this image here an example of an instrument and a tool and a block diagram. In this case, I'm going to show um, and the use of the SHA-3 uh, secure hash algorithm, third version, the most current version of, of SHA. And, um, and so if we think about what's on the tool, we've got a SHA-3 authenticator and some tool function, whatever it is. And then on the instrument side, we've got to have the ability to uh, operate SHA-3 as well. So I just call it here SHA-3 function and some host electronics that are going to, you know, get use and utilize that, that tool function. So this is our, um, this is our example that uh, we'll speak to. And so again, the use scenarios I've already spoke to, to these, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but you know, we want to authenticate, securely update data in the tool, authenticated reads of operating parameter, and, you know, securely count the number of, of tool uses. And then ultimately, you know, in a lot of cases, we want to electronically, if you will, and, and in a secure sense, expire that tool so it cannot be used again, can't be, you know, fished out of uh, medical waste uh, with a dumpster diving type technique, if you will, and, uh, and put back into the supply chain. Um, and, and so, again, I'm showing this bidirectional capability that uh, we're, our authenticators are going to support tool to host and, and host to tool. 
All right. I, so I said SHA-3. I want to just quickly, um, you know, it doesn't do SHA-3 a whole lot of justice, but quickly speak to how we would use SHA-3 in this application. So with SHA-3, uh, we can uh, compute this uh, value we'll call a message authentication code or a MAC. And so the idea is in this, in typically, you know, this is the typical example of Alice and Bob where we uh, kind of describe cryptographic principles. I don't know what Alice and Bob are always talking about. There's something secret going on here. Uh, for sure, but uh, so Alice is going to deliver a message to Bob in this case. We're going to use SHA-3 and this message authentication code capability of SHA-3 such that when Bob gets it, you know, he can ensure, if you will, or test that that message was in fact delivered from Alice, okay? So here we go. Alice is going to deliver a message to Bob. Maybe that message is, I don't ever want to see you again. And, and so she delivers that message to Bob um, in this, you know, up, up in the upper portion here, this envelope. And then what Alice is going to do is she's going to take her message. I don't ever want to see you again message. She's going to hash it with SHA-3 um, with a secret key. Okay, so we got the message plus a key going into our SHA-3 computation. And the output is this value we call a MAC, a message authentication code. So the message gets delivered to Bob. The message authentication code gets delivered to Bob. Bob receives the message. He reads the message. He says, I don't ever want to see you again. And he says, wow, did this really come from Alice? He needs to figure that out. So now he takes the key. That, in fact, so very important point here, the key that Bob and Alice will use is the same in this symmetric uh, key-based implementation. And so you just got to trust me there's a way to, uh, for, for both Bob and Alice to have the same keys in a very secure sense without the two of them actually meeting. We're not going to cover that today. So same key on both sides. Bob got the message. Bob uses the same key Alice used. He hashes that message as well, computes in MAC, tests that MAC against the one received from Alice. Now with those two MACs match, then Bob knows that that message he received from Alice, which says, I don't ever want to see you again, in fact, came from Alice. If it did not match, well, it came from somebody else, and so we can be happy. So at a high level, this is how we'll use SHA-3 in this uh, protection of medical tool uh, example. So I'd like to, again, kind of go back to uh, what we spoke about on a uh, slide ago, and you can touch on one specific scenario here. So uh, we can do a lot of things, as we can see, but what we're going to talk about is authenticating the tool, you know, to the instrument before it's used. So this is this tool, you know, or sensor or peripheral, whatever it is, you know, to this host instrument uh, before use. All right. So I'm going to go down one level further. So we've been talking at a high level. This is still fairly high level, but one level below, just so we can think about how SHA-3 would actually be uh, able to, to uh, um, satisfy what, what we're uh, wanting to do in terms of authenticating a tool. So um, here I've, I've got a little more detail again. So this is uh, on, on the left port portion of the screen here. This is the medical tool or the sensor. So I'm going to speak to the kind of the data come up uh, or the elements, if you will, that are going to be inside of our SHA-3 authentication IC. So this represents, again, the SHA-3 authentication IC that would be uh, inside of a tool. So data elements uh, include a unique serial number. We also call it a ROM ID, renal and memory identifier. Um, and it's going to be different in each and every part. So all parts, unique ID. We're going to have a unique secret as well. Okay, this means every single authenticator has a different secret that will be used for this SHA-3 computation. And there's also going to be some application data, you know, that's stored. It could be operating parameters. It's really not uh, critical for this, this conversation. But the two important, uh, and then, of course, we have SHA-3 computational capabilities. So we're going to do that in hardware in our authenticator, I see. So really the unique ID, the, uh, the unique secret, and the SHA-3 computation are kind of the important items here. When we think about our host instrument, again, similar uh, elements that exist. We've got a system secret, which, you know, we see a unique secret in our authenticator. We have a system secret. It's going to be the same, you know, for the system that resides in our medical instrument. We also have the ability to generate challenges. You know, think about these as, you think of these as kind of like a random number. It doesn't have to be perfectly random or a number that we only use one time, a non, you know, pseudo random. You can describe it in a lot of different ways. But just think of this as a, an ability to generate a challenge, which again is a number. And, of course, we have to be able to compute SHA as well. And, and we're going to have an interface between these two. And you know, so there's a lot of interface types that can exist. I'm not going to really uh, go into that today. All right. So I talked about this unique secret that's in our authenticator, I see. And this is so important. 
each and every part, you know, for, for if you will, um, best practice would, would have a unique secret in it. Um, and, and why that's important is that all products have the same, you know, secret in them. If, if it's ever discovered, then we have a class break, meaning every product that, that exists in the field um, is compromised because the secret, you know, if it's not unique, is, is known. All right, so unique secret in our part and these data elements that we just spoke to. So what I want to talk about here is how do we get this unique secret into the part? You know, how do we come up with this unique secret? So this is something we're going to do one time in a secure environment. It could be, uh, you know, Maxim has a service that does this, value-add service. Customers do this, you know, in their locations or wherever they're performing manufacturing. Um, the point is this is done one time in a secure environment, and it works like this. In the previous slide, I talked about this system secret that would be inside of the of the instruments, and this is a, a static value, doesn't change. Um, the second data, or the second element I, I show here is the, I call it slave ROM ID. This means the ROM ID that happens to be the authenticator that will ultimately go in the, in the tool or the sensor, and some computational data. Again, I'm just gonna gloss over that. It's not really super important for this conversation. So we take this system secret and the ROM ID that's in our authenticator IC, and this other data, and we're going to perform a SHA-3 computation, compute this value called an HMAC, you know, a hashed MAC. I talked about MAC in a previous slide. Just, this is kind of a variation on that. But a SHA-3 computation, that value becomes and is programmed into our authenticator IC um, as the unique secret for that particular part. And you can see we use the ROM ID out of that authenticator plus the system secret to compute what is now the unique secret that's in that part. We're done. That's complete. After this step, which again is done in a, in a secure environment, there's never ever, you know, any secret information that's exposed from our authenticator IC outside the electrical boundaries of the part. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about uh, now. All right. Now that we've got that, let's go through the example of all right, now the you know our, our tool that has this unique secret in it is attached to a medical instrument. Now, how does the medical instrument compute that unique secret. We need to, you know, the medical instrument needs to know what that unique secret is in order to authenticate that tool. So it's kind of like what we just looked at, but in, in a little bit in reverse, if you will. So the medical tool is going to, or excuse me, the instrument is going to request the ROM ID, the serial number that's in our authenticator in the tool. It's going to get delivered. Now we have the system secret. Remember in the previous slide, we took the system secret and the ROM ID and we computed a, an HMAC. So perform that same operation here on the instrument side. Now we've computed an HMAC. That is, remember, the unique secret that we programmed into our authenticator in the manufacturing environment. So we're done. We've now got the unique secret that's in that authenticator. And we can move to the next step. Ultimately, we wanna authenticate that tool that's attached to an instrument. So this works as follows. Again, we got our tool or our sensor and our instrument with the, uh, the elements that exist in them. All right, step one, again, the instrument's gonna request the ROM ID, the serial number from our authenticator, that gets delivered. Now the tool has the uh, unique secret and the ROM ID value. It's gonna generate this challenge, okay? Again, this is a random number, think of it that way. And it's going to deliver that challenge over to our authenticator IC. All right, so now our authenticator takes its ROM ID, the unique secret and the challenge, and computes again in HMAC in step four here and delivers that back to our instrument. All right, so now our instrument has pretty much everything it needs to test that that tool is in fact authentic. It's got the unique secret, it's got the challenge, got the ROM ID, performs a SHA-3 computation, computes its own HMAC. So it's got the HMAC from the tool, it's got its own computed HMAC, tests those, if they match, boom, done. You know, that tool is in fact authentic and can be trusted and can be used. And if not, it's, it's you know, it's not authentic and it could take uh, whatever uh, actions are appropriate for the application. And, and one final point I want to talk about is, they got medical, right? These these tools need to be sterilized before they're, they're used on us humans. Otherwise we have big problems. And so we have to think about our security, our, IC, our authenticator ICs, you know, are they compatible with the sterilization environments that, uh, that typically are used in, uh, in, the, in the world of medical. And so I'm just, I'm not going to speak to these in a lot of detail other than point out these are the three most commonly used, autoclave, you know, heat, steam, pressure, duration, uh, ethylene oxide, uh, lower temperatures, lower 
um, uh, exposure times, but there's other, you know, <laughs> problems with, with ethylene oxide in terms of uh, exposing those uh, gases, if you will, to humans. And then radiation, you know, gamma or EB, which is also, you know, commonly used. Obviously, these, these have done it a very uh, uh, controlled environment. But we got to make sure that our authenticator IC is compatible with these. And and the good news is, uh, you know, the Maxim's products are. Uh, we have devices that can uh, be used in, in any and all of these sterilization environments. Going to wrap up here. So, you know, some of the key points I wanted to, to uh, make sure everyone goes away with is, you know, again, performance, uh, quality, human safety, even brand reputation. These are all reasons that are driving the need to, to manage uh, these, these peripherals, these disposables. Um, you just spoke to the sterilization topic. Got to make sure that our, our products, in fact, our ICs, our authenticator ICs can survive that. And, and I guess the key takeaway is, you know, we've, uh, Maxim have been uh, working on this for quite some time. We have a full pro portfolio to address all of these needs uh, with various cryptography and, and, and so on, all the things that we talked about, inc including sterilization uh, compatibility. And with that, I, um, I, I guess I would ask if there's additional information that uh, um, you are looking for, please visit our website. And we have lots of details there. And, uh, and then finally, thank you so much for your, your time. And with that, Joe, I hand it back to you.